25 years ago, Congress passed and President Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act of 1996. This was the biggest overhaul of our nation's communications policy in over half a century. The timing of this landmark law was not a coincidence. This was the dawn of the internet age and policymakers on both sides of the aisle wanted to clear the path for the proverbial information superhighway. And in the years following the law's adoption, broadband deployments and adoption surged. Consumers in the United States enjoyed waves of new products and services, and innovators in the United States set the pace globally for the emerging internet economy. Now, while the 96 Act accelerated the transition from the analog era to the digital age, it also reaffirmed the promise at the heart of the FCC's founding statute that communications and advanced communications should be available for all Americans. The 96 Act was not a one man or one woman job. Many people are responsible for the passage and implementation of this legislation. To celebrate this anniversary, I'm honored to present the reflections of the policy pioneers who made this progress possible. Hello. And uh, thank you, Chairwoman Rosenworcel, and thank you to the rest of the commission for including me today as we mark the 25th anniversary of the 1996 Telecommunications Act. Um, I have with me um, uh, a copy of the act uh, with the digital pen that uh, President Clinton signed it with, uh, which he gave to me uh, at that ceremony at the Library of Congress and one of the ink pens that he also signed it with. Uh, Al Gore is there, uh, obviously, but this was a huge moment because before Congress passed the Bipartisan 96 Act, almost no one in America had high-speed internet access. And just think about that. No broadband just 25 years ago. And it led to an explosion uh, in deployment of broadband. In fact, four years later, by the year 2000, uh, we actually were able to move towards a balanced budget in the United States with 40% of the revenues coming in just over a five-year uh, period from the Telecom Act and our deployment uh, of additional spectrum uh, for uh, people to have the third, fourth, fifth, sixth uh, cell phone licenses in the United States, a revolution. Uh, and it triggered paranoia-inducing Darwinian competition. Uh, it unleashed... Uh, uh, trillions of dollars of private sector investment that laid the fiber and launched the networks of today. And it connected millions, tens of millions of children to the internet in their schools. And it also helped to catalyze a digital revolution that has transformed American life. But the variety of crises we face today demand that we use this occasion to also look forward and we will create a promising digital future if and only if we continue to prioritize the principles of inclusion, equity, and non-discrimination, the principles that were enshrined into the 1996 Act. Uh, we have to move with urgency to promote broadband adoption and affordability, uh, starting with children on the wrong side of the homework gap, restore net neutrality protection so the online ecosystem remains free and open for entrepreneurs and activists, combat consolidation and promote competition that will benefit consumers and grow our economy and eliminate discriminatory data uses and biased algorithms that are harming vulnerable populations in our country. On this anniversary, we have an opportunity to redouble our efforts and ensure that the next 25 years are defined by bold action on these urgent issues. There's no time to waste. So let's get to work. Thank you all for everything. Uh, that you do uh, to continue this revolution. Thank you. Fred Upton here, former chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee and actually uh, the Telecommunications Subcommittee as well. 25 years ago, we passed this amazing bill and we've seen broadband uh, come. We've seen our lives change and we're not done yet. Thanks everybody for the job that you do. We're pushing forward to do even more. God bless. When the Telecommunications Act of 1996 
was signed digitally by uh, Bill Clinton in the Library of Congress. Uh, Ron Brown, the Secretary of Commerce, grabbed one of the real uh, analog pens that was used for the digital signature and, and gave it to me. And uh, uh, tragically, sadly, Ron was killed not long after uh, flying on a diplomatic mission over, uh, over Serbia. Uh, but, uh, but I, but I had the pen, uh, went back, uh, to the FCC and, um, Ruth Milkman, Blair Levin, you know, we all gathered in the office and said, now what do we do? The, uh, the, the problem or the opportunity was that we had intervened in a couple of respects in the drafting of the bill, but one particular respect relevant to the FCC. Uh, we had insisted that there be deadlines put on the completion of every one of the regulatory processes that was required under the act. There were more than four dozen so for every one of the four dozen, let's call them items, there was a, a specific deadline. And the FCC, as you know, doesn't normally live by deadlines. But I really did believe that everybody would benefit eventually from this. Uh, and uh, number two, because they could have a long rest afterwards. And then number two, uh, that there wasn't going to be any way to get uh, a, a consensus and unanimity if we weren't put under deadlines by Congress. Uh, so I was responsible for the deadlining and uh, then uh, we said to Ruth Milkman, you're responsible for then making it all work. And in order to dramatize that uh, and make sure that she couldn't uh, um, be too shy about it, uh, I called a press conference and I had Ruth publicize the schedule. Uh, of each item, what would come first, what would come second, what would come third. And I will say that in her uh, normal low key way, she pretty much blew away the entire uh, legal practice in Washington because they'd never heard the FCC ever do anything like saying, we have 48 different items. This is when they're going to be commencing. This is when they're going to be resolved. Here's the schedule. You all wanted full employment. You better be hiring up. So that was the impact on the FCC. So we were committed to enhancing productivity and technological benefits. Uh, and when the 96 Telecommunications Act was passed, we saw each of the items through that particular lens. The particular case in point that I still feel really chuffed about is the E-rate because um, with Al Gore's leadership and Ed Markey's leadership, uh, in particular, but also the cooperation of Tom Bliley and, and Jack Fields and a number of other um, Republicans, we were able to get the authorization to do the E-rate, and then we had to implement it at the FCC. And uh, it was one of those things where, you know, well, nobody was against the E-rate, but nobody knew, not many people knew why they were for it. So, um, so we did a lot of things over the course of about a year and a half nonstop to build a base of support. And then the day came when one of the members of my team came in and said, well, we've got the deal. And I said, well, how much did we get? And I was thinking, you know, maybe it would be a couple hundred million. And the answer is, well, the starting number is 2.1 billion. So since that day, more than $100 billion has been dedicated to internet access in classrooms and libraries. I think it was really important that the internet be the first innovation in education since chalk that was distributed equally to everybody in the country, regardless of where they lived or how much money their families had. Hi, this is Congressman Frank Pallone, and I'm just here to celebrate 25 years of the 96 Telecommunications Act. I was on the Energy and Commerce Committee at the time that it was passed, and I just think it's very important for competition and uh, pro-consumer policies. I mean, obviously, competition leads to customers having uh, 
more choices and leads to better prices and, and better services. Uh, and also the 96 Act made uh, the critical universal service programs like Lifeline and E-Rate permanent. So we're celebrating here 25 years later, uh, this really important legislation that we were able to accomplish. Thank you. 25 years ago, President Bill Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act into law to usher in a new era of how America communicated. In the ensuing years, the legislation provided a framework for a rapidly revolving industry that allowed us to become more interconnected than ever before. As a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, I have worked closely with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to ensure our laws and protections in this sector keep pace with the staggering pace of innovation. And now, as we turn our eyes to an often unpredictable future, we need to debate and discuss bipartisan reforms and updates to meet the demands of a changing world and our constituents. We need to enact universal broadband so no one can be denied the power and potential of new technology. And we need to continue on the mission of the Telecommunications Act to create equity in our communications. And I'll also close thinking about somebody that I loved with my whole heart and soul who loved this law, these laws, the making of laws and this industry more than most and actually helped write most of those first laws. I'm thinking of John Dingle and Bill Clinton today as we celebrate the 25th anniversary. Hi everybody, it's Commissioner Rochelle Chong out in California, one of the commissioners that implemented the Telecom Act. A shout out to Team Chong who helped me get that done. I wrote a ditty for the occasion. Happy birthday, Telecom Act. Hi, I'm Larry Irving. I was the administrator of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration um, and the Assistant Secretary of Commerce um, during the Clinton uh, Gore administration. Part of my job was to help negotiate the uh, 96 uh, Telecom Act. I, I think it was important for a couple of reasons. One, uh, like so many people, the E rate was, was critical. The E rate helped us expose the internet to millions of children across the country, opened up library service for millions of folks and helped jumpstart a nascent uh, telehealth service. I don't think we'd be anywhere close to where we are in terms of how we use technology in schools and libraries and in health centers, if not for the 96 Act. But one of the things that people also forget is how important this act was for international telecommunications policy. I traveled across the planet with my colleagues in the State Department, the FCC, talking about privatization and competition and um, light touch regulation. And those were the watchwords for the next couple of, 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 dec um, of decades. But for the U.S. passing the 96 Act, 
um, we'd have a very different global telecommunication in that sector. Let's remember that in 1999, when I left government, half the people on the planet never used the telephone. Half the people on this planet lived two of my hours from the nearest telephone because most telephone service was provided by um, government-owned uh, telecommunications uh, companies. The 96 Aptal changed that. Uh, it changed the world. And I don't know that we'd have the internet we have, and I certainly don't think we'd have the populist revolution in use of telecommunications if not for that 96 Act. I'm Susan Ness. I served on the Federal Communications Commission from 1994 to 2001. It's hard to believe that the Telecommunications Act of 1996 was signed into law a quarter century ago. I recall the hallowed linoleum tiled halls of 1919 M Street, where we chilled out during a government shutdown while Congress hammered out a deal. I recall the excitement on February 8th when President Clinton digitally signed S-652 in the reading room of the Library of Congress. And I recall the long nights and weekends when a diligent and bleary-eyed FCC staff plowed through more than 80 rulemakings in 18 months to implement the act. I recall thanking Senate Committee Chairman Ted Stevens of Alaska for appropriating extra funds to keep the heat on thermostatically, that is, during the winter and the air conditioning during the summer so that we could get it all done. And I recall that all of the regulations were completed on time and adopted unanimously. My, how the world has changed since then. Not only is the FCC no longer located at 1919 M Street Northwest, it is no longer at the portals, which was under construction back then. No one is lobbying today to get into the long gone, long distance business. The seven baby bells back then are now one baby bell, renamed AT&T. And regrettably, the commission has become more politically divided over the last 25 years. But a new day has dawned. I echo the recent comments of Chairman Michael Powell at the State of the Net conference. He encouraged commissioners to work together not as Democrats or Republicans, but as civil servants, leading an expert agency that is striving to do what is best for the American people, consistent with the rule of law. And now a few comments about the 96 Act itself on its silver anniversary. The Act was a transitional roadmap, looking backward to resolve long-fought battles between the powerful telecom, long distance, and cable industries, and not a navigation device for charting the digital path forward. Global policy challenges today, cybersecurity, online privacy, disinformation, and incitement to violence were not on our radar. The stated goals of the act, competition, deregulation, and universal service were largely achieved often in spite of rather than due to our well-intended efforts. Mandated biennial reviews of mass media rules are now quadrennial reviews and are still running behind. Connecting schools and libraries to the internet was one of our major achievements. 25 years later, the E-rate remains essential, but it must be updated to solve the homework gap, which the pandemic has exacerbated. Oh yes, there was an obscure section of the 96 Act, CDA Section 230. We looked at it, shook its four corners, and wisely determined that it was self-effectuating. Nothing there for the FCC to do. The world has changed, but the North Star of the FCC, diversity, competition, and localism, still shines brightly. Happy anniversary. Greetings as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. I'm Gloria Tristani, and I served as FCC Commissioner from 1997 to 2001. During those years following the passage of the 96 Act, one priority stood out for me from the get-go, the E-rate program. At a time when most knew the internet as a World Wide Web, 
Congress recognized that supporting computers in schools, libraries, and most importantly, in classrooms, was critical to ensure that children, no matter what their background, would have the opportunity to succeed. I'm proud of the vital steps we took to advance the E-Rate during my time at the Commission. We ensured that classrooms were connected, not just the schools. We ensured that funding was targeted first to those most in need. And we pushed to maximize funding from the start. 25 years later, the E-Rate has only grown in importance. Since the outset of COVID-19, the home has become the classroom, yet the digital divide painfully persists. Studies estimate that as many as 17 million children lack broadband access at home. The digital divide, which has affected the homework gap, now is stopping many children from going to school at all. These days, Attendance is marked when a child opens up her laptop, fires up her broadband, and connects to her teacher and classmates virtually. Sadly, the millions of children without broadband may be deprived of an education entirely. This virtual attendance gap will only be bridged when the Commission uses its tools to ensure affordable and fast connections at the home for all children. As the Commission moves forward, you have monumental work ahead of you. But I know that this Commission is nothing without the expertise and the dedication of its staff. I commend you for the difference you have made in the lives of countless Americans. There's no denying that we've made tremendous progress over the past 25 years. And thanks to everyone who has helped us reach this point. It's equally clear that the stakes have never been higher for communications policy because access to modern communications for everyone, everywhere, has never been more important for full participation in American life. And on that score, we still have work to do. So today, I hope we can celebrate the past and commit to making more progress in the present. After all, these pioneers have shown us that we can do big things. They've shown us the way forward. So let us honor their legacy by embracing the challenges and working together to build a brighter digital future for all.